Hello, everybody. Welcome to session 13, Strategies. Our first speaker, well, my name is Araceli Samaniego. I'm with uh, Pacific Invasives Initiative and Auckland University. And our first speaker is David Will. And we are going to hear about considerations and consequences when conducting aerial rodent eradication. So I give you the warning because we don't have this thing. OK, great. I'm sure you'll be All on right. time. Okay. I'll try my best. <laughs> Thanks, Araceli. Um, I'm David Will, GIS Manager at Island Conservation. I'm going to start off this morning taking a bit of a deeper dive into aerial broadcast and some of the implications for um, conducting projects. Over the last 10 years, Island Conservation and our partners have conducted a wider range of uh, aerial broadcasts to target and, and remove rodents from islands, from uh, temperate islands in the Aleutians in British Columbia in the Antipodes, to uh, wet tropical islands in the uh, Hawaiian Line Islands, uh, and uh, dry tropical islands in the Galapagos and Puerto Rico all the way down to the sub-Antarctic sub island of South Georgia. And because we had this whole wide array of projects and our aerial baiting data was collected in a fairly comparable manner, we thought it would be interesting to see if there was any way we could look across all these projects to, to inform future planning for aerial broadcast eradications. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the principles of aerial broadcasts and then really focus in on a couple of key questions. One is what factors are associated with deviations in bait use? And then we'll also look at variability in sub-island bait density. So looking at some of those um, bait density maps, uh, similar to the ones that Evaristo showed the other day, and looking at how we can identify significant gaps in coverage from some of those bait density maps, and what some of the implications are for um, tropical rodent eradications. Um, I'll only give a brief history of aerial broadcast here because I think Peter Garden is going to give a much uh, more in-depth history. But I think the important point to uh, point out is that um, aerial broadcasts were really revolutionized with the inclusion of a uh, GPS guidance system that allowed pilots to keep uh, pretty consistent flight parameters and also the development of mechanical spreader buckets that allowed for an even distribution of bait. And those two things really helped um, create uh, more precision with aerial broadcasts and allowing for more data analysis of, of, uh, and monitoring of how projects are conducted. Um, <clears throat> the big difference between a, an aerial eradication and a fertilizer application is really trying to make sure that there's no gaps in coverage um, because as we all know to conduct an eradication uh, all rodents have to have access to a lethal dose of bait. And again compared to some fertilizer control applications, islands uh, have some unique challenges in trying to ensure even distribution of bait across an island, mostly due to their small island size and their uh, interaction with the marine environment with a large coastal area compared to uh, mainland uh, fertilizer applications. And also you can see here with this picture of Pinzone and the Galapagos, really steep, sheer coastal terrain can also add some challenges when trying to um, do broadcast applications. We've heard quite a bit about some of the principles for aerial, aerial rodent eradications. Um, and this graphic here shows some of the best practices from, uh, from New Zealand, where flight lines start and end from the, from the coast. And there's a 50% overlap between flight lines going across the island to minimize the chance of gaps between flights. And there's also a coastal boundary where uh, there's an additional overlap in flight along the coast to try and reduce the chance of gaps along that coastal edge. Um, and also to help deal with some of the challenges in terrain, there's generally an additional application of bait over areas of steep terrain like those coastal cliffs that we saw in the previous image. But there are um, quite a few regulatory environments um, or other areas where you want to actually minimize the amount of bait into the marine environment. Um, and, and the US is certainly one of those places. And you can see in this picture here of Palmyra, you can imagine on this small landmass. Um, with very convoluted and complex coastlines, it would be incredibly challenging to try and both ensure an even distribution of bait, but also minimizing the amount of bait that goes into the marine environment. Some of the ways that that has been done is using different kinds of bucket configurations. You can see here a directional half swath where bait only comes out one side of the bucket so that um, you can control which uh, side uh, or where the bait is going. And there's also a narrow swath bucket where bait's coming out at a very narrow between five to 10 meters. Um, in the graphic here, you can see uh, another strategy to try and minimize bait in the marine environment compared to the previous one, where flight lines are not st starting and stopping right at the coastline. They're starting and stopping inside of the coastline. And to reduce the chance of gaps, 
um, you need to do two coastal uh, runs, one right along the coast and then one inside of that to try and minimize the chance of gaps. Um, but compared to the previous strategy, this definitely has a higher risk of gaps along the coastline, but it also means that you're going to be using more bait um, than you would uh, on the previous strategy. So with some of these principles in mind, we looked at what factors were associated with bait use. So we looked at physical island characteristics like island size, elevation, um, the ratio of the coastline to the island area, and then we also looked at operational characteristics like um, the number of flight lines flown or the number of exclusion zones that were excluded from aerial treating to see if any of those um, caused deviations in bait use. And so we uh, looked at these in three different scenarios. Uh, perfect, which would have been a completely even distribution of bait across the island. Planned, which was based on predicted flight lines that would predict overlap um, between flight lines, overlap along the coast, and also additional treatment areas like cliffs. And then we actually looked at actual bait, which was how much bait was actually applied. And then to make these comparable across the three different scenarios and across all different islands, we looked at the percent change in total bait uh, as deltas, with delta perfect planned representing the um, uh, amount of bait that you planned on using. Uh, delta planned actual would represent um, changes in bait during the implementation, and delta perfect actual would represent the changes in bait between both planning and implementation. Uh, so we looked at these and um, we did a Spearman's rank correlation and looked for things with moderate effect size to see if there's any association between a variety of different factors and those deltas. Um, and you can see here that uh, with increasing uh, island size, that your delta in a, a planned bait went down. So what this meant is that smaller islands were planning on using more bait. And that seems sensible because if you think back to those earlier graphics, um, on smaller islands, the total amount of area around the coast where you're gonna have more overlap between the interior flight lines is going to make up a larger percentage of the island area, so you're going to have sensibly uh, use up more bait. Um, there were no significant factors in delta planned actual, um, which suggests that um, e it was either a nuance of the data set or uh, potentially that um, the implementation of plans is independent of some of these island factors. And if we looked at delta perfect actual, um, we'll see that, again, increasing size, increasing coastline, and uh, increasing coastal complexity were uh, associated with, with delta uh, changes in bait use. And again, this goes back to islands of smaller size, islands with really complex coastlines are going to be using more bait than larger islands. Um, interestingly, um, increasing elevation and increasing number of exclusions were associated with less uh, total percentage in bait change. And this was slightly unexpected because we would have thought that islands with increasing elevation, increasing steep terrain would have needed more bait, but with both of these, they were more associated with island size, so it was probably a nuance of the data set that we didn't have uh, enough samples in there to really dive into the question about whether elevation was associated with more changes in bait use. Um, and then if we look at some of the nominal factors, um, we just did some descriptive statistics to see if there was any, any differences. And really the, the interesting and big difference here is that U.S. projects tended to use less bait than planned. Um, you can see here the, the averages for Delta Perfect planned were 20%. Uh, the U.S. projects tended to plan to use the same amount of bait. But if you look at, uh, on average, most projects tended to use more bait, while the U.S. projects tended to use less bait. And I think this is probably a, a result of some of the, co the complex uh, uh, regulatory restrictions in the U.S. and also the fact that many of the uh, projects that were conducted, uh, the planned amount of bait was actually the, at the legal maximum. Um, so, so by ne necessity, people wanted to leave a little bit of extra bait in reserve, so you're going to tend to use less bait than planned. Um, so the next question that we looked at was sub-island bait density. How does bait density vary across islands, and how do gaps compare to home range size and are there any implications for tropical uh, rodent eradications? Um, if you remember back to Evaristo's presentation, uh, we did very uh, a somewhat similar to the, the old model that we, they used where we took flight line data and um, su summarized overlapping flight lines to create a bait density map that shows uh, an estimate of what bait coverage would be like on the ground. 
and we express that as a percent of the target application rate. So you can see here the areas in dark blue represent areas that are 50% of the target application rate. And we also, to make this comparable across a bunch of different projects, we uh, percent, uh, create a graphical representation that shows it as the percentage of total area treated. So again, you can see here uh, in this example that 7.9% of the total treatment area was less than 50% of the target application rate. Um, and you can see some of those areas are small slivers on the inland side, but a lot of it is along the coastal edge, where in this case, bait was likely going into the marine environment. So those didn't necessarily represent true gaps, um, but uh, just kind of gaps that went beyond the, the coastal area. So if we look across uh, bait density across a, a large number of projects, you can see that the, the projects highlighted in red here are generally larger islands and larger islands with a single block. And you can see that they had a higher percentage of total treatment area that was um, near the target application rate compared to other islands um, that were generally smaller islands or uh, coral atolls that tended to have a large variability in, in bait density. And if we think back to the previous factors, again, this makes sense that islands with more coastline, islands with more coastal complexity are going to have much higher amounts of overlap and a greater variability in bait density. If we go back to our Tenerunga example and just pull out areas that are less than the target application rate and compare this to the minimum home range size um, that's been observed on um, Palmyra and Kerry Atoll, you can see that um, some of these areas uh, are, some potential home range sizes are entirely encompassed within um, some of these areas that are less than the target application rate. Um, and that could have implications if we think about some of the, the previous things that we found uh, some of the previous presentations that suggest that some rats, particularly pregnant females, might not be moving a whole lot. Um, so there is some potential risk here that um, if you're working on uh, an island with, with rats with small home range sizes in the presence of crabs on tropical islands, that these slivers and gaps between, between flight lines could be a potential risk. But we don't really know what the consequences of, of areas less than 50% of the target application rate are. So that's something that we could look, uh, look to in the future. And again, if we um, compare these, these same slivers and these same potential gaps to average home range size, we can see that in, um, for, for, for rats, we can see that um, they don't make up the entire potential home range size. So again, it, it, it kind of suggests that the definition for gap rate, for gaps, needs to be site specific and, and planned in advance and that we need to really be matching the risk variables to the project to what we consider to be a significant gap size. And that's it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right. No, actually, I got, a, I got a little bit of something to have a little more time. Where are we up? What's that? 30 seconds? Okay. Um, so just a quick summary. Um, creating bait plans is really useful to informing planning. Uh, small, complex islands should um, plan on using more bait, and um, particularly in the U.S., uh, seeking site-specific site regulatory approval um, would be really useful. And just like I mentioned at the last slide, matching your gap tolerance to the risk variables will be important to um, planning projects. Thanks. Yeah. So we're just on time for the next speaker. So now we have Greg Hall, also from Island Conservation, and we are going to hear about interim control of moose musculus brain on albatrosses at Midway Atoll. Welcome, Greg. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And that's the light. The light. That's the light. Okay. So um, orange is 10 minutes and red is 12 minutes. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the other day I blamed uh, Donald Trump for uh, some colleagues that couldn't make it. I'm going to blame him again, but I'm also going to blame uh, Ivanka Trump uh, for not allowing um, some of my colleagues oops, to, uh, to join us today. I'm speaking on behalf of the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Wildlife Refuge System that really is, is, did a lot of the work and led a lot of this effort uh, with some of our uh, advice from afar. Um, we're in the interim process of, of developing uh, an eradication uh, plan for protection of albatross on, on Midway Atoll. Uh, and uh, in the, 
this is a summary of some work that was gone on, has gone on in the past couple years that's looking at uh, house mice and, the, and impacts on, on breeding uh, lace and albatross. Uh, we're going to be talking about Midway Atoll. Midway Atoll lies about 1,900 kilometers uh, north, uh, northwest of, of, of Honolulu. It uh, lies within the Papahanao Mokuokea uh, Marine National Monument. It's uh, about 596 hectare of, of beach strand habitat, a true coral atoll. Um, and it has, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service is, a, is the major landowner out there and it manages it as a national wildlife refuge, uh, in particular because of the uh, breeding seabirds that are out there and all, as well as about a 12 mile uh, perimeter boundary. Um, it is the world's largest uh, breeding albatross colony. Uh, every year the Fish and Wildlife Service does a, uh, a count out there and this past year uh, they've documented 560,000 pairs <laughs> of active nests of lace and albatross, about 26,000 or just shy of 20, a little over 25,000 uh, black-footed albatross. And in the middle here, in this photo, you can see, um, however this pointer works, uh, one pair of, of uh, short-tail uh, albatross that are courting. They breed primarily uh, off the islands of Japan. Um, historically, this island has seen uh, human activity since the end or beginning of last century. Um, major pivotal um, World War II battle. It's, it's a surprise that some of these, these birds persist. In addition to the, the lace and albatross, or the albatross that are out there, there's about 17 other uh, breeding seabirds. There's activity year round. Um, in 2015, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, during their annual surveys, for the first time ever, uh, documented some major injuries exclusively to, to adult lace and al adult albatross, exclusively to lace and albatross. There was no documented impacts on some of the, um, the black-footed. Every year they go out and they survey every nest. They walk the perimeters around the island, up and down transects, looking at every nest and documenting the progress of the breeding success of these birds out there. And for the first time in 2015, they started documenting uh, injuries that uh, were a little bit concerning. They documented a number of, of uh, Mortalities, um, look, documented mortality, nest abandonment, and of course the injuries. And so they laid some cameras because they started to suspect that it was rodents that were having an impact. Um, rats and mice were introduced onto the island in, during World War II, over 75 years ago, um, but mice persisted after a black rat eradication that happened in 1996. And they were unexpectedly documenting that these mice had turned on the lace and albatross. This was not seen historically on Midway Atoll, but we've been seeing it, you've been hearing about it through Marion, some of the work on Goff, some of the horrific incidents uh, that we're seeing, particularly on, on the young chicks that, on Marion and Goff. But here on Midway, interestingly, it's, it's exclusively on, on the adult lace and uh, albatross that are attempting to breed. Um, we're seeing a number, that first season they saw about uh, 200 to 300 uh, individual birds that were being impacted. Um, and it was really in very small area. The island is about uh, 486 hectares on Sand Island. Uh, just some background real quick, again, because of historical military use. Um, this is an extended operations uh, active runway. Anytime anybody's flying over the Pacific, anybody who's heading home after the conference that's heading over the Pacific from North America into the Asia region, you're going to be flying in vicinity of this. If there's something that's going to happen to your aircraft, odds are you're going to land on, on Midway. Um, the impacts that they were seeing were really documented in three primary locations with a single event right here. Uh, again, it was very small, again, for the first time ever that they documented this uh, on, on Midway. And they initiated a response once they confirmed that the mice uh, were impacting these adult birds. They started, first of all, doing a survey work, uh, evaluating where those impacts were. They worked with uh, whatever tools they really had on hand because of the isolation. Um, they really just had to work with what they had. They had some, uh, some good nature traps that they were, were using for uh, some of the biosecurity purposes. And generously from uh, Bell Labs, they donated some uh, live traps, multi-catch live traps. They didn't have access to, to rodenticides or any other tools out there. Um, and so the first season, they began controlling rodents the best that they could with the tools that they had access to. And in the meantime, we began preparations uh, moving towards, uh, number one, uh, preparing for next breeding season, which is just wrapping up and, um, or has wrapped up, and also for the consideration of, a, of an eradication, developing a feasibility study for an eradication. 
However, um, on the island, in addition to, to the breeding seabirds, 17 species, uh, the island is used by uh, migratory shorebirds, such as the bristle-thighed curlew, um, that is a, a vulnerable species, and the use of rodenticides was, uh, was, was, they were very nervous about the use of rodenticides. Uh, in addition, it, it's also home to an endemic uh, laysan duck. It's a, uh, a critically endangered species, an IUCN red-listed species, so any management activity that they, that they wanted to move forward to protect the, the seabirds, they also had to consider uh, balancing the potential consequences to, to these species. Um, and because they didn't want to have any impact to the, both the shorebirds and the uh, lace and duck, um, we began working with uh, Bell Labs um, to, to look at alternative tools, uh, particularly the rodenticide use. And we ended up settling on uh, a bait containing a rodenticide, cholecalciferol. It's very much different active ingredient than the traditional anticoagulants, much less toxic to birds. In other words, you can deliver bait to the mice on the island with very little chance of toxic exposure to, to lace and duck or migratory shorebirds. Uh, for those of you that are interested, uh, it's a calcium mobilizer. Basically, it just puts a pulse of cal calcium into the bloodstream, and as a consequence, mortality is, um, is relatively quick. It's, a, it's considered a subacute com uh, compound. But again, the main message here is that uh, it doesn't have any potential toxic consequences to birds. So we began uh, doing all that paperwork, getting ready for this coming breeding season, and the impacts to, to breeding albatross this past breeding season really ramped up. Again, there was only three locations, but each dot and or perimeter boundary here shows impacts. So the mice, the previous year, again, the, historically has never been seen before, um, or at least documented, uh, three, three core areas in, in the 2015-16 breeding season and in 2016-17 it was pretty much around the entire island. Each, again, each of these dots represents a single event and these little circles represent perimeter boundaries of, of areas that, that birds were being impacted by, by house mice. Uh, there were teams of uh, field, field volunteers and people that are living on the island documenting uh, the, the seabirds and doing the monitoring on the island. Volunteers that, that invest a lot of their own money to have a chance and opportunity to come to Midway to count uh, the birds every year. Uh, they were deflected and brought in and they were given training on the handling of rodenticides and how to, how to treat the area and to protect the birds. Um, because of the regulatory environment, the United States is fairly strict. There had to be very strict protocols and how they, how they had to go about it. And because of the breeding, overlapping breeding, not only the, the lace and albatross that they had to, to avoid, there was a underground layer of about a million breeding bone and petrels uh, that had created burrows underneath the, uh, underneath the breeding albatross that you had to be very careful to walk around. And as a consequence, it was a very slow, laborious process, taking 17 people 20 hours to do one, uh, one application across the entire, entire atoll. In 2015, the area was 1.65 uh, hectares that was impacted, and in this past breeding season, the total land area with breeding albatross um, was about uh, 11 hectares. And I believe the numbers um, that they talk about, that they documented, they had 1,200 uh, injuries documented this past breeding season, about 250 dead birds, and uh, 900, almost 1,000 abandoned eggs in total. And so the Fish and Wildlife Service now is moving towards an eradication that they hope to, uh, they're in the process of development of that, we're working with them to move forward and they're hoping within the next year or two or the next, uh, next couple breeding seasons to have that implemented. Just looking at some of the, um, again, some of the, the work that they did, they had to document not only uh, the impacts on uh, reduction of impact as their management action, but they also had to document the impacts on the mouse population as a consequence of their treatments. Um, simple science, um, basically there's the simple, the zones that they treated here, the five zones just for comparison's sake. These are the size that, that they treated. Um, the main message here is that the bigger uh, areas that they treated resulted in declines of mice across the board, um, uh, while the larger areas, the populations either remain stable or in the case of the control sites, actually the populations uh, went up. And was it successful in reducing some of the impacts? It was definitely suggestive. 
Um, some of the areas that they treated, again, this is the large uh, areas that they treated. Um, it's okay, you can stay if you want. Have a seat, it's okay, yeah. It makes it real, yeah. <laughs> so anyways, it's, uh, uh, this baited area showed some reduction in the impacts on the, on the albatross. Uh, again, some of the spikes popping up uh, versus a control site which showed some of the increasing in the impacts on the, on the, uh, on the breeding albatross. Again, it's, it, the science isn't really strong here, but it is part of the requirements that we're dealing with in the United States is that we have to do our best to demonstrate, number one, are you having an impact on the target population? And two, is the conservation outcomes that you're trying to achieve, are you actually making it, making it happen? This is an interim measure. This is something that was just to buy time to minimize an impact. I see that yellowish orange light. Thank you. Um, and I'm gonna wrap up here real quick. In short, um, again, it was just a, an interim measure to buy some time to minimize that impact. As the seabird ecologists in the audience know, every adult bird is extremely important. Every, every nest that's lost could have a potential consequence to the population. Um, the Agrid-3, the colocalciferol uh, rodenticide product, did show some suggestive impacts or suggestive knockdown of those populations on bigger, bigger uh, treatment plots, had much bigger effect. Um, and I think they said that uh, it was one of the things that they wanted to me to report was that the attacks ended 20 days sooner uh, on the population. But for me, what's really standing out here, which is interesting from the Marion and the Goff situation, this is exclusively on adult birds. They do, docu they do follow 100% of, uh, of the population throughout the breeding season, and they documented no impacts of mice on chicks out on, on, uh, on Laysan Alba Albatross on Midway. Um, again, the, the smaller treatment areas had ambiguous results. Definitely bigger is better, um, but some of you who do this, some of this treatment do know that. Um, and more importantly, because we, we did focus on the use of colicalciferol, um, there's no evidence of any negative effects on, on non-target species. Thanks. for a quick question, maybe? <coughs> yeah. Can you just wait for the microphone, please? Okay. They're recording the talk, so <laughs> it's important. I'm curious to know if the, uh, the, the colicalciferol might take off for wider use, this special bait that you've uh, developed, and for other places where we're worried about non-targets. <laughs> Uh, in terms of its efficacy, um, it's a little, the, the data is a little ambiguous. I mean, you can talk to Craig at, at Bell a little bit more about some of the laboratory toxicity data. Um, the, the major benefit from our purpose is that we wanted to knock down a mice. It appeared to succeed uh, for control operation. At this point, I wouldn't necessarily look at it from an eradication perspective, um, although historically in the past, uh, working a little bit with uh, folks in Mexico, we did test some of that colicalciferol for eradication purposes, and on a very small island, it actually did work. Um, so there is some potential there. Again, the major benefit of that product is that, for, at least for birds, the toxicity is very, very, very low. One quick question. Do we have a microphone? Thank you. She got swung around on the dance floor such a lot last night, so it's good to see her sprinting here too. Uh, I'm very curious about the chicks. Uh, why on earth would they not be attacking the chicks, which seemingly would be an easier prey, prey option? Yeah, I can't even <laughs> speculate. That, that I had the same, I kind of question, are you actually monitoring? Um, are you actually documenting? are you actually going out and monitoring? And they're monitoring on a regular basis 100% of that island, 100% of that population. So if they're seeing any impacts, they would have detected it. If the mice are taking the chicks, they would have documented it, and they're not documenting it. And what on earth? I have no idea. I was thinking about it this morning. I don't know if it's something maybe they're queuing in on that the adults are feeding on that's just some odor or something. I don't know. It's, I'm curious if anybody has any, any thoughts or ideas around that. Maybe it's just a matter of time. <laughs> Maybe it's a matter of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Yep. No. Nope. Thank you very much. <laughs>
<laughs> right. So our next speaker is Paolo Sposima, and he's going to present about rat and lagomorph eradications on two large islands of the central Mediterranean. Okay. Good morning. I am a um, consultant of the National Park of uh, Tuscan Archipelago. And um, in this scarce time and with my poor English, I'll try to describe you the two largest um, black rat eradication concluded on Mediterranean islands that have uh, involved in a different way also two species of lagomorphs. The two islands are um, in the Tuscan archipelago in the northern Mediterranean Sea. They are of similar flat area, about 1,000 hectares, but are very different. Uh, oh. <laughs> this is the flat Pianosa, and on the background you see Monte Cristo. The main eradication targets, main uh, conservation targets, were shear waters, the Yerkuan that breeds on Monte Cristo, and the Scopolis that breeds on Pianosa. Then other species were favored by the rat eradication, <coughs> like uh, these uh, endemic snails of Monte Cristo and these Mediterranean Gico. The main eradication target was the black rat, but both uh, eradications were multispecific. Now I'm try I will uh, speak only um, about uh, other rodents and lagomorphs. On Monte Cristo, there was a um, feral population of uh, rabbits that was not the target species for legal reasons. Uh, so we had in specific actions like searching and culling of uh, survivors, and consequently the eradication was unexpected, also due to the presence of, a, of an area excluded from aerial broadcast. On Pianosa we had a population of uh, house mouse. Its eradication is uh, unlikely due to the distribution method. And there is an introduced population of brown hair that was an eradication target, but during the first phases of the project, from genetic analysis, we discovered that with this was the last existing population of the Italian subspecies, previously considered extinct. So we decided to change from eradication to protection. The um, very different characteristics of the two islands have determined the distribution um, method. The um, Monte Cristo is a very rugged island uh, with no roads, only very few paths, so the only option was the aerial broadcast. That was favored by the fact that the island is uninhabited and the access is strictly limited due to the natural reserve. The main risks were for the um, population of goats of ancient introduction that has a high historical value, and for the very common yellow-legged gull that usually eats the pellets. Uh, so to protect the goats, uh, we kept uh, 44 individuals in, um, in a fenced area that was excluded from aerial distribution. This is the very different Pianosa. Uh, the name means flat island. Uh, as you may see, no. As you may see from the maps, uh, there is a very good road network, perfect for a ground-based operation, and uh, is inhabited. There is a prison with uh, 30 detainees, uh, two wardens, and some more people. Uh, there are tourists in summer months, and there are several species uh, at risk of direct poisoning, including the brown hair. So we worked with bait stations. Consequently, the main risks were for was the main risk was the secondary poisoning of uh, raptors and of very few 
pets, domestic cats that live in the inhabited area. To reduce the, to reduce the risk for these uh, cats, we used the bromadiolone instead of brodifacum in the um, inhabited area. No. <clears throat> On January 2012, we distributed bait on Monte Cristo. We adopted the best practices, but we had some difficult, as, ex as expected, due to the unexperienced pilot. But, however, black rat had been eradicated, and uh, unexpectedly, also rabbit had been eradicated. And uh, we have had also very positive results for conservation target species. This is the reproductive success of uh, Yelkon Shearwater that uh, immediately increased and now the population is increasing. On Pianosa, the operation is uh, still ongoing because we distributed bait uh, between uh, January and May of this year in uh, nearly 5,000 uh, bait stations uh, that will be removed uh, next uh, October. This is the trend uh, of this is the trend of bait consumption. During the last uh, control in May, we've, we have found only one sign of rat presence in a single bait station and eight or nine signs of mice. So the um, results have to be confirmed but we are optimistic for the black rat eradication, much less for the house mouse, but uh, it was a non-target species. It's too early for uh, seabirds response, but uh, maybe that first positive effects are already visible because these very small species of shrew mm, seems to be more common than previously. The costs had been much higher for the operation, terrestrial operation on Pianosa. Also, if we consider the costs of goats enclosure construction, and despite the greater isolation of Monte Cristo, and the consequence higher costs for logistics. This is our bucket with our bucket expert. This has been used for all Mediterranean aerial distribution, that are three, not uh, so many. <laughs> and um, we have had some negative effects uh, on non-target species, but uh, nothing of uh, unpredictable. The worst negative effects uh, had been those derived from, from public opposition uh, that had been uh, much higher for the aerial distribution of Monte Cristo. Then mm, we had problem due to the uncertainty of the Italian legislation. We had uh, legal procedures against us that are concluded positively for us. And uh, now the um, situation had been clarified by the European regulation, but it's very difficult that uh, an aerial distribution will be authorized in the future. Mm. The biosecurity is very easy on, appears to be very easy on Monte Cristo due to the restricted access. We have a, a biosecurity system, and to test um, his effecti its effectiveness, we released uh, 13 male rats, and we captured uh, nearly all of them in a very short time in a very small area, so we had been very so dis satisfied. On Pianosa, obviously, is more difficult due to human activities and the regular connections uh, with the mainland. In conclusion, uh, we may say <coughs> that uh, on Monte Cristo, the aerial distribution had been completely successful, more than expected for the rabbit. And um, we, it has been cheap. And uh, the negative effects on non-target species have been uh, similar to those op observed on Pianosa. Despite this, uh, we probably will not be able to carry out similar operations unless there are a change in the European regulation or, more, more importantly, 
cultural change in the um, national competent authority. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions, for changing audience. Speak yeah. slow. Just wait for the <laughs> microphone, oh, just there. Is it on? Uh, goats, uh, did you find that some goats ate bait and were any goats affected by the O the operation? Uh, so, sorry? You Did goats eat some ah, of the bait? Goats. Yes, yes, a lot. Goats eat baits. We had 44 protected, and uh, out of the um, fenced area, they have had a mortality that uh, we estimated, they estimated, they, uh, um, between 25 and 40%. Another question? Uh, do you know if any organization or individual is uh, lobbying the EU to change its regulations and make it easier to deliver this work? No, but uh, I have to say that the European regulation is uh, enough clear because it says that uh, there are some rules but that you, have, you may have a um, derogation for environmental uh, protection uh, issue. But as uh, my colleague Dario said, um, they don't consider the risk of the extinction of a species like uh, uh, adequate uh, reason. <laughs> so. Still have time? We should use the time, so please. <laughs> I was interested in the shrew yes. that you had. Um, there are a number of folks here actually looking at trying to eradicate shrews, different um, species from islands. I found it interesting that you had bait in the presence of shrews. Was there any indication that they, any shrews succumbed to the bait? No, any indication about it. They had been found inside bait stations, probably eating uh, insects. But uh, have I have wrote? Um, we had uh, two observations in 18 years and three in two months without an increase of the research activities. So um, it seems, but I'm sorry, we haven't uh, mm, a, a monitoring uh, mm, <laughs> on these species because it was unknown until a few okay. times ago. Recent, until recent time. Okay, thanks. But I think it's very interesting that they are using the bait stations because they might be eating the insects that are eat, that are eating the bait. Yeah. Yes. So it could be a secondary, and shrews are like tiny, so yes. it would be interesting to Many check that if, if that is enough to eradication in, in a different situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our next speaker is William Key, talking about tackling invasive non-native species in the UK overseas territories. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So I'm going to be talking on behalf of myself and now more about the, sorry? Oh, how many minutes do I get on orange? Orange is 10, and then red needs 12. OK. Right, thank you. Right, so we're going to talk about the UK overseas territories. and. This, presumably, is the magic wand. Yes. So the UK non-native, or the GB non-native species secretariat was established in 2006. Uh, it's a very small team. We're now one, one extra person on that. Um, and the role of the secretariat is to coordinate action against non-native species um, across the government in GB. And one of their main um, roles is the implementation of the GB non-native species strategy. Um, the revised edition 2015 has 59 key actions, uh, one of which is specifically for the UK overseas territories. Um, so that is to strengthen support for the territories with actions such as um, continuing support of the Ferrer Identification Service, 
sharing technical expertise and providing training, um, including in biosecurity. Now, the OT's biosecurity project um, began in January this year. Um, the aim is to improve the biosecurity of the overseas territories um, against non-native species, and this is to improve environmental resilience and food security. So we don't just have environment, we have food security in there as well. Um, this will be achieved through um, access to UK government expertise, uh, which includes training, um, and the first step of this project was obviously to work out, well, what do we need to do? What, what is the strengthening that's needed? And we carried out a gap analysis. Um, this is across what we call the biosecurity continuum, so pre-border, border, and post-border, um, and also looking at all impacts, environmental, agricultural, and social. So what do we, oh, well, first of all, UK overseas territories, um, a good quiz question is to ask, people to try and name them all. Um, there are 14, and together with the dependencies of Tristan and Ascension, there are 16. So you've got um, six up in the Caribbean, six in the South Atlantic, two in the Mediterranean, one in the Indian Ocean, and one in the Pacific. So we have 16 in total. So what did we do? Um, we identified 22 components and if you were able to tick good for every single one of those 22 components, you would have very, very strong biosecurity. And these were divided into three areas, one for prevention, one for early warning and rapid response, and one for management, prioritization, and frameworks. So we consulted each overseas territory um, and asked them to rate their capacity and justify that rating. And we have a four um, levels of scoring, so none which is scored at zero, it's a, it's a red, red for danger, there is none. Um, basic is orange in color, it's scored of one. And for an example of basic, you might have a project, but you haven't started implementing it, but you've got the funding. You might have something just starting, but you're not really, haven't got very far. Um, some, yellow, score of two. Maybe you're well advanced on your project, maybe you're strong for environment, but weak for agriculture, or, or the other way around for that component. And good is more or less reasonably strong, green, good for go, um, score of three. And in each case, having established a score for each of these components, we consulted people from IUCN, RSPB, organizations like that who have recent experience of each territory and asked them if that made sense and adjusted if we felt necessary. Now, I'm going to show a big scary table, and I don't want you to read it. I want you to glaze your eyes and look at the colors. It's very appropriate after last night's little party. Okay, so don't panic. Um, what we've got here is the first area of prevention, um, and the columns are the different components in prevention. So it's like horizon scanning, risk assessment, pathway analysis, and you've got the territories in the rows. And what I want you to think about this table is how red it looks. It's really, really red. Red is score of none, there is none. It's really, really red, okay? If we look at the second area, this is early warning and rapid response. We've got surveillance, alert systems, monitoring in the columns. Again, the 16 territories in the rows. And it's a little bit less red now. There's more orange and yellow. Okay, just unfocus your eyes. The color is changing. And if we look at the third area, management, prioritization, and frameworks, again, the different components in the columns, the 16 territories down the side, and it's a lot more green. So it's quite clear just visually that the first area of prevention has a lot more none, red for danger, than this third area. So I can give you a little bit more quantified, because this is about science, right? So this is the same information with the figures. So we've got the first area of prevention here, and the average score for the territories is 8.1. You've got the middle one, early warning, rapid response, average score of 10.3, and then the final one, average score of 11.9. So clearly there is more capacity gaps in the first area. A little bit of detail. So how do the different components compare? Along the bottom here, we've got the 22 different components, just in ascending order and there is their total score. And you can see there isn't actually much between them, um, but we do have a couple that are standing out at the top there. 
And this top one um, is baseline information for plants. So the overseas territories actually don't do too badly on baseline for plants. They're quite good at having databases and knowledge on plants. Um, the next two down, this is also baseline information. This is baseline information for um, invertebrates and also for marine, because for quite a lot of these components, we split, um, for example, monitoring, rapid response, and baseline. It wasn't an overall. We split it between plants, invertebrates, um, and vertebrates and marine, so that we could get a feel across the board, because it is different. So you can see that the very top ones there is all about baseline. The territories are quite good at knowing what they've got. If we look at the bottom two, um, we've got horizon scanning, and we've also got contingency planning for things like marine species at the bottom. There is least capacity for these, which isn't really a surprise. Um, horizon scanning, it's a difficult thing. It's uh, knowing what's out there that's not arrived yet. And the marine environment um, stands out quite conspicuously. This next little group of three, there we've got um, risk assessment, we've got rapid response, and we've got surveillance for things like marine non-native species. So the bottom ones, it's marine and it's horizon scanning. The top ones is baseline. And there isn't a lot between the others. All the full information is in the paper. So what about the actual territories? What we've got across the bottom are the 16 territories in ascending order with the scores. The highest score was 51. We did score the UK just for fun to see what it would look like. And it came out at 58. Um, so the total possible is 66. So the UK's got a little bit of a way to go there to be really, really good. Um, but uh, 58 isn't that much higher than the highest overseas territory. Um, any guesses on which is the top scoring overseas territory? Nobody wants to hazard a guess there. So this one right at the top is actually South Georgia and the South Georgia, uh, the South Sandwich Islands. That is the highest scoring, South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands. The next two down is British Antarctic Territory and St. Helena Island. Now, it's kind of logical that the sub-Antarctic territories would do very well because they're relatively simple in terms of ecosystem. They are not permanently inhabited. There is quite a lot of research um, effort goes into them. There is a winter shutdown that makes things a lot easier. So you would expect them to be able to score quite highly on biosecurity. So that isn't a surprise. And St. Helena has been the subject of a four-year project to strengthen biosecurity in anticipation of air access, which I'm going to be talking about later on today, if you're interested in coming to the South Atlantic with me for 10 minutes. Um, so those are the top three, and, and that's probably why they're the top three. Now, I'm not going to go into detail for the others. There isn't very much between them. As you can see, it's a score, just one, maybe two between each one. So the others are kind of clustering and not much to distinguish between them. It's only really those three that are outstanding. Okay. So we have some general observations um, from the reporting back that we got. Um, the first is that legislation, and that's also um, border procedures, tends to be based on historic um, ex-colonial focus on agricultural production and protection of things like animals against diseases. So you have this historical legacy that is still very evident uh, in what is happening at the border, and particularly for legislation. There is very limited extension of any of these across to um, invasive non-native species of wider environmental concern. Um, it's understandable. This is an expensive, difficult thing to move ahead, but you, you can see it in the practices. Um, as has come clear from many other presentations, and we all know, from this exercise, coverage of the marine environment is particularly weak, with a few exceptions. Uh, the lionfish in the Caribbean, there is, uh, it's been a vehicle for catalyzing a bit of work there, but on the whole, that is a weakness. Um, officers, biosecurity officers often have a range of functions. They're not just sitting there at the border. 
They are, they're, what, they're at the airport. There may be one person, maybe two people, maybe they're part-time. They're at the airport, they're down the wharf. They're busy doing their management plans. They're doing the cost. They've got to go and talk to government. Oh, and that, they've got to take some home leave. Um, and then they're back in. Oh, they've got a million things to do. It's very hard for them to focus on their job. It's very frustrating for them. And that became evident. Uh, the frustration to be able to deliver even um, within the limited capacity that's available. And very often, of course, in these very isolated islands, um, the biosecurity officers lack access to technical specialist expertise, to diagnostic facilities, um, and in many cases, appropriate training. Um, so they're doing a very, very good job in the face of a lot of challenges. So what are we doing about it? This is the good news. This is the, they're coming on to. Uh, the project is funded by um, uh, the UK government. We've got about a million pounds for three years, yay. Um, but of course, that doesn't go very far across 16 territories over three years. Um, and of course, a small isolated territory, it is not appropriate to, to attempt to do the full biosecurity spectrum of pre-border, border, post-border. Post -border. You've got to focus on where the risks are because maybe you can afford to semi-neglect some things to focus your priorities. You need to know what those priorities are so that you can really target them. Maybe you have limited border operations, but you put more effort into post-border, or maybe it's the other way around, but you have to know what those risks are. So how do you find that out? You need to do horizon scanning. So we'll be doing horizon scanning exercises, we'll be doing pathway analysis, and where appropriate, helping the territories to develop their strategic action plans. We'll be looking at legal and policy frameworks, training, and using regional bodies. And as I see the chairperson standing up to jump on me, acknowledgements for everybody in the territories that contributed to this to make it as useful as possible. Um, and thank you for the donor for funding. Thank you. We have time for one or two quick questions. The mic, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. Very, very educational. Um, and it occurred to me that um, there's an illustration of just how difficult this is because the top ranked UK overseas territory, of course, is South Georgia, where there has been an, an enormous amount of work to improve biosecurity. The, the sobering um, fact, though, is that within four years of us finishing the rat eradication project, a rat came ashore at South Georgia very likely from a government vessel. Mm -hmm. And that, that just to me illustrates mm -hmm. how complex this whole process is. Yes, and I think it's probably true to say no biosecurity system, however strong, is 100%. All you can do is try and identify the highest risks and put in those defenses as well as you can. And that's a very good example of one of the things we have to rule against. It was the highest ranking, it still wasn't 66. So we do recognize the gaps there. One quick question. Ah. Sorry. Jill, I just am interested to learn if uh, the governments themselves are actually putting financial support to their biosecurity systems. And the is that the financial support to the biosecurity systems in the territories, is it funded by the UK government or is it from the countries themselves, like the territories? It would normally be the countries themselves. It's their, their national border. It's whatever they are prioritizing in their national budgets. Yeah. So how in the future are we, uh, is it the plan for dealing with the gap in financial support to biosecurity? It's dealing with the capacity, so technical training, access to diagnostic facilities, and helping the biosecurity officers to identify what are the high risks so they can focus their very limited resources to those areas. It's probably um, helping them work out how better to use the limited resources they've got. We're not fundraising for them. We're not giving money in that sense. It's not really what we can do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Xavier Lambin, talking about achieving large-scale, long-term invasive American mink control in northern Scotland despite short-term funding. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. Good morning. So today I will talk to you about the ups 
downs and ups again of an invasive control project that will ask you to judge as being either bold or foolish. So that project tackled the American mink, one of the world's most difficult invasive species in an area where prevention had failed. The invasion had run its course. It tackled mink on a ridiculously large bit of an island, 29,000 square kilometer, a third of Scotland. It did so over nearly 20 years without having secured long-term funding. And it did it while having fuzzy, ever-changing endpoints as to what our ambition was. And finally, it did that using mostly unpaid volunteer citizen conservationists that had to be supported and motivated. So please hold for 10 minutes before coming to a final judgment. Maybe it's heresy. So the project was largely motivated by the water vole. The water vole is basically a rat. A rat, what a cuter than the rat that most of you are trying to kill. It is also a rat which is in the UK, has a lot of cultural baggage. It's a species that had declined by 95% because of mink over 20 years before the project started. And the project really arose as part of the UK government response to the Convention for Biological Diversity agreed in Rio, where, by the way, some local uh, biodiversity uh, action plan projects uh, taken on by the community. The project starts in the north of Aberdeen. Uh, Waterfall had been wiped out for most of northeast Scotland, and one small population was discovered north of Aberdeen. And our efforts were initially concentrated on safeguarding this tiny remnant population that was finding itself in the sea um, uh, of mink. The project really arose from a research project, and all of the, the, the overall project is really, has always been a, a parallel effort between research and conservation. And throughout, I will show in purple the spending spent on research, and in blue, the spending on uh, conservation delivery. And we managed to uh, obtain a small amount of resource to remove mink from that small population, and that was done rather quite quickly through a, a, a cage trapping. Of course, we knew that it was tantamount to emptying the sea with a bucket to try to protect this small population for the long term. And in the meantime, we became aware that nearby, in the newly established Cairngorm National Park, shown in yellow here, a large mountain massif, there were still very large water vole populations. So thus we had, the, we had the prospect of instead of trying to safeguard one desperate remnant population, to try to prevent the continuing decline of a much larger population and the ecosystem process that were associated with that species in that environment. The Cairngorms is, a, is dominated by a head of moorland and is a lot of growth shooting activity. Some very rich people have as leisure to shoot those things out of the sky. They also, other people are spending their time catching salmon. These are very prized activities for rich people, and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people who are paid to control predators to make that leisure possible. Those people provide a potential workforce that could have been harnessed to uh, defend these uh, large uh, water vole populations. So we reason that if it was possible to remove mink durably anywhere in mainland Scotland, it would be in the Cairngorm National Park because there were all those people who already had an interest in the issue. So it was a research question of interest to us as academics to what, what extent uh, we could use predator prey theory and adaptive management, active adaptive management, to optimize mink control. And we were able to obtain substantial resources for this and to obtain from uh, Scottish Natural Heritage, a government body, and, um, and a, a charity, sizable money, three protect officers, one research uh, 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 postdoc, for three years. And our initial goal was to clear mink from 6,000 square kilometers and later 9,000. We did this using a somewhat top-down functional uh, uh, approach to participation. That is, we harnessed the existing goodwill and skill of all those people with different interests who agree on very few things other than killing mink, and we deployed their effort in a very systematic fashion so as to achieve a comprehensive coverage of mink control over the whole uh, national park. We did this using this, uh, this device, the mink raft, that we have seen, probably have seen before, which is really a breakthrough, which makes it possible for people to bind the, the control process to different extent, either monitoring mink or uh, trapping mink when they are present or dispatching mink once mink has been caught. 
So we uh, deploy this on a very, very large scale, and I will spare you the technicalities, but basically it works. If there is mink and a mink raft, they meet each other and we remove them. We deploy this on a vast scale, and we use what I call a rolling carpet strategy, which is not dissimilar to the remove and protect approach described uh, yesterday, but with some depth. That is, we start in the headwater and spread, spread uh, uh, down the valleys, uh, having behind a permanent network of rapid reaction and vigilance behind the expansion front. Now, quite quickly, we managed to remove Ming from the Cairngorm National Park itself. And the reason why this was easy is because the, the, uh, the, the, the National Park is basically a demographic sink for mink. Smart mink don't go live in mountain tops. We mostly had juveniles and, and, uh, and dispersing individuals finding themselves in the National Park and causing havoc with biodiversity. But most mink were born in the lowland. So rather than sitting, sitting there and defending the park in perpetuity, we decided to expand the project, shifting our end point from 6,000 to 9,000 square kilometers and try to get the mink where they were born, that is largely in this lowland plain, much more fertile and much more productive, that is sending mink up the hills. I'll cut a long story short, but the bottom line is that after three years of control in the catchment, each line here is a catchment, we are able to reduce mink to very, very low densities indeed, near zero densities. Not absolute zero, because it's a flux of incomers, but we, we are removing them very effectively. This is despite the fact that there is strong density dependence in mink to both compensation and dispersal. Every mink we caught was also genotyped, and from this we are able to reconstruct a pedigree and the pattern of dispersal from mink. And this is why mink is such an effective invaders. They fly. They just are stupendous dispersers. They're able to move vast distance and, and re recognize areas. So this brings home the point that coordinating action for controlling mink is absolutely essential. It is pointless to work on a small scale like you started. It is even pointless to work on a single catchment because mink are moving between catchments. So we had achieved quite a lot of things in those first three years, but of course it was a risk of falling the cliff edge of funding after three years. So at that stage, what was, had been a project, a research project by University of Aberdeen, was handed to a, a new partnership involving the Rivers and Fisheries Trust of Scotland, which is an umbrella body that federates 14 ri river trusts that manage the local fishing resource. We obtained substantial additional funding from the EU, as well as from charities and from SNH, as well as, as further research money to, to, to document how this, the, the process could be optimized. So then we are able to reach a truly stupendously large area and also benefit from the presence of a coastline on three of our, our, our sides of our protected area and large mountains. So we were approaching a quasi-island system. And we had all those different fisheries trusts who were partners in the project. We deployed minkraft on an even grander scale and were mostly able to remove breeding mink from this area. There are still mink moving around, but there is no evidence of breeding mink. Not everything was easy, of course, because this key area that I highlight as being crucial for mink productivity, in fact, has no fishing trust because there is no salmon running there. So there is not the infrastructure, the resource, or the manpower. So in this area, we had to invest a lot more of our own project resource to achieve the crucial high coverage required to prevent mink born in that area uh, contaminating the rest. An only limit limitation of the volunteer approach is that you need volunteers. And in northwest Scotland, there is hardly anybody living there. There are some tourists in the summer, but a very sparse population. So it was really quite challenging to get enough volunteers there, but we have an enormous uptake. Most people has, have been willing to volunteer to do their bit for protecting their local bio biodiversity. Of course, when deciding if this is money well spent, you might would ask, what about legacy? Well, our strategy to achieve legacy is this embedding with users of salmon resource. We hope that as long as salmon will be running up and down the Scottish rivers, we will, we will be able to sustain this, uh, this uh, mink control uh, in partnership with those people. We are trying to optimize the work, make it as easy as possible for them, by trying to understand better the spatial dynamics of mink and identifying those attractive sink that will be attractive, uh, attractive those dispersal arriving in the area. We spend a lot of time and effort trying to optimize the working with volunteers, using Mink app and various 
uh, attempt to better understand what makes volunteers stick and keep going day after day, despite being, uh, there being no mink living footprints on their raft. And of course, in the last two years of, uh, of funding, as we are funding uh, with use, we transfer responsibility to the River Trust to make sure that, that uh, this uh, pro project will last beyond our, our, our project. It will require funding, not zero funding, but some funding. So what's the money well spent? Well, the headline figure that is that we spent 1.8 million pounds over 20 years to free 29,000 square kilometers of the influence of mink. Add to that the research money from different streams, and that's less than 100 pounds per square kilometers. I would say that's peanuts. So a few thoughts. American mink can be controlled on a large scale. It can be done. We have optimized the process. It's not a technical issue. It can be done. Working with volunteers does work. It is highly cost effective, but it is not free because volunteers need to be renewed, refreshed, new people must be recruited, they need to be supported and, and encouraged. That requires a little bit of money. The major issue is short-term funding. It's a major obstacle for long-term management. It makes it more expensive. It's economically absurd, it's bonkers, it's stupid. <laughs> so every time we have to lay off staff, we have to reappoint people, we have to rebatch the project, package it in a different way. This is damaging to the trust relationship we've built with our communities. We have a plan for uh, longer term sustainability, and Chris Howell uh, talked about it on, on, uh, on the Tuesday, which is called uh, Scotland Invasive Species, Species Initiative, which will be more ambitious still, scaling up that approach to not one species, but a range of species. Thank you. Thank you. We do have time for questions. Do we have the mic? Please. I think this is an extraordinarily ambitious and wonderful piece of work. Would you like to tell us your thoughts on the cost and practicality of expanding this to the whole of Scotland and then to the whole of the UK? Um, so our current configuration is to work really with uh, users of, of, uh, of, of the river system and salmon. And on, there is plenty of that on the east side of Scotland. We have real challenges expanding on the west coast of Scotland. We have tons of islands, much more uh, difficulties of access and so on, and fewer people. So I think there is a physical limitation by what there is uh, um, there. More broadly, I think... There is, I firmly believe there are ways of finding different entry points in communities about different invasive. And on the, we have educated thousands of people. That's a massive asset, and they talk to their neighbors and so on. And I, I think there is great scope for doing that. What is the entry point for each species? It will vary. Uh, there will be obstacles, but then I always say, what's your plan B? You know, who else has a, how, how rich is your government not to deal with invasive on a large, uh, on a large scale? This is not perfect but it achieved great things. Another question? Oh. Thank you. Um, I remember here in the UK, you had the, there was a lot of opposition or some opposition even for projects about the rats. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder whether these wonderful results you're achieving could, uh, survive without uh, stimulating such reactions by... So we had no opposition. We have always talked very, very openly about the fact that we, you know, mink end up in our freezers with a piece of lead behind the ear. And we have always been very, very transparent. And uh, we, we, we had some people, you know, who don't like killing things, but there virtually has been no opposition. So I think the, the opposition is largely overstated. Um, even in rural, uh, urban communities where people have, don't have a sense of, uh, of wildlife and the issues there, it hasn't really been, a, been an issue. We mostly work in the countryside where people are not more used to live, live off the natural environment. But I, maybe we have been lucky, but it has not been an issue. We have been always prepared you know, for some strident attacks or some you know, mishaps, but uh, it has not been an issue. It's great. Thank you very much. Good luck with the program. <laughs> Thank you.
Right, so our last speaker of this session, a friend of mine, I have to say. <coughs> so it's not Julio. <laughs> not Julio. <laughs> I'm sorry, yes, yeah, a change in, um, in the agenda. So we have Luciana Luna from Conservación de Islas talking about seabird restoration and advances towards the eradication of feral cats on Guadalupe Island. Thank you, Ara. Thanks. Thanks for saying for the last uh, talk. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm going to give this talk on behalf of my colleague, uh, Julio Hernandez, uh, about the advances towards the eradication of our cats to protect seabirds on Guadalupe Island. So just uh, Guadalupe, it's in the Pacific Ocean, 260 kilometers offshore of the Baja California Peninsula in Mexico. It's a, it's, it, it is an inhabited island. There's a Mexican Navy base in there, a fishermen cooperative. And also, we have a biological station there. So basically, we stay there, and, well, different people every time, all year long. Uh, there's a lot of uh, very unique fauna, invertebrates, many endemic species, spiders, grasshoppers, and crickets, you name it. And also, uh, land birds and seabirds, a lot of endemic species in, in there. And unfortunately, cats and mice are present on, on, the, on site. So which are the, the seabird species that we want to protect on Guadalupe? So the Guadalupe murrelet, it, it used to be considered as a Scripps, a part of the Scripps murrelet population, but um, recent uh, genetic studies a few years ago, they determined that it was something different. So this, uh, this one is mainly on Guadalupe. There are a few individuals close and another island close to the mainland, but basically they rely on Guadalupe to, to, to survive. Another species, Black Benta Sea Water, there are only three. It's a Mexican, it, it's a species that is only in Mexico in the northern region. And it's only in, on Tree Island. And Guadalupe is very important for the protection of the species. Cassis Aglet, also very important for the region, shared with the, uh, the states and Canada. And Leech Storm Petrol, which is also um, doing genetics, even though it's considered a Leech Storm Petrol in the same species as the one that is in other places. Uh, it seems that its uh, genetics have shown that it's something unique for, for Guadalupe. So, it's very, very important to protect uh, the site for them. And also the Lysan albatross. Lysan albatross arrived to Guadalupe in uh, 1983, so very recent colonization. But it has become one of the most important um, colonies in the Eastern Pacific. <laughs> so uh, the problem are that cats, uh, the same that, well, information that you already know, and they have caused extinctions and extirpations from the place. So extinction of the Guadalupe Storm Petrol, extinction of several land birds also. And the situation was that we're still predating all leeches, uh, um, especially this, the, those uh, breeding seabirds that are still breeding on the main island where the cats are. Uh, mostly they're affecting uh, storm petrels and lice and albatross. They're working a lot of, uh, even both adults and, and chicks. So it was urgent to, to do something about it. Uh, of course, since we have the, the mice and we have been hearing a lot about the impacts of mice and, and seabirds, uh, it was um, necessary to, to do some research about it. So this is uh, just, um, so we have the, the cats, the mice, and the seed. So basically what we, we did some, well, this was, was my, my PhD, which I will publish soon. Nick, thank you, yeah. Um, so basically, the cats are limited by the availability of uh, the main prey on the island for them is uh, they rely on, on, on mouse. And mouse are limited mostly by uh, introduced grasses and the seed from introduced grasses. So the numerical response of, well, the, the rate of increase of this rely on this one and this one rely on, on this one. And also, uh, as um, we haven't seen um, indication that cats are regulating um, mouse density. That means if mice have enough food that will just go um, up despite the predation by cats. And unfortunately, there are just, as I mentioned before, the native species uh, that uh, are affected by the, the cats and, and, and for this interaction I just mentioned. So in this graph, we see some numbers just from 2012 to 2014. So in winter, so the highest densities for mice are in summer and autumn. And because cats are following that, the highest densities will be in turn in autumn and winter. So we're getting very high densities of cats in winter. 
and this is uh, these are the seasons where the um, the seabird starts to breed. So we ended up with no mice, no food for cats, a lot of cats, and the seabirds nesting. So that's that's a problem mostly for the Isles, Lysa and albatross and other two of the seabird species. So um, for to protect the seabirds, we started the control in 2013, uh, 2003, sorry, and so far. Only for control, we have killed more than a thousand cats, and only in Punta Sur, which is one of the, uh, which is the place where the seabird, the Lysa albatross, and many of the seabirds were extirpated, in two years, with a lot of uh, effort, uh, we have succeeded um, excluding the cats from there, even though it was very complicated to keep with this control and trapping. So we ended up uh, building a, a cat fence, which creates a peninsula, a small area free of, of cats. And this is, the, this is the, the fence, the image of the fence. So this is the southern end of the island. And basically, because this is the main island and there are some islets, so that some, many of the seabirds rely on the uh, islets, which are free of uh, feral cats to, to breed. So the, the density of seabirds on these places, the nesting um, competition is, is very, very high. And the idea was just to uh, free, um, create a, a free place, a free area, area free of feral cats to allow the return, to protect the lice and which are inside this area and also to allow the return of, of the other seabirds to this, to this place. And well, this is a work from uh, Julio, Julio Hernandez. Um, so basically what we have in here is that when the albatross arrived, they colonized in 1883, and from there they were trying to, there's a lot of immigration from, uh, from Hawaii, and there they, every year they were trying to, um, they were nesting, they were producing chicks, but they um, were, the reproductive success was very low, so they were struggling to actually maintain that colony on Guadalupe Island. So here's the year when we started control, and from there, the, the um, population grew exponentially. And well, in here in 2014, we set up the, the fence, so that will, will continue. But it's very hard to maintain in the long term, and we have been basically uh, focusing the control and, and the breeding um, areas for, for seabirds. So it's very, very difficult to keep that in the long term, as you know. So the good results inside this area, and uh, so this is the, a chick of the, the murelet, which we used to be finding only on the islets. And now, since the last year, we have been finding nests inside the, the fence. So for this year, 40 nests have been recorded in that, in that area. So um, this is the scenario, scenario of, this is when we started the, the control in the Lysa and Albatross colony in 2003. And this shows the result, the uh, predicted uh, result of not being doing nothing. But we started the control, so the, the population started to going up. And this will be the, the scenario, just uh, continuing, not only for the albatross, for all the breeding species, if we, um, for, the, for the eradication. So for doing so, that was very, very important. We, uh, we were conscious. And, and we realized that we need to do the, the eradication since the beginning. However, it was very, very difficult to convince uh, donors and un to get the funding for doing, for doing it on an island of, of this size. So uh, and those, all these years, we have been working and gathering all the information. And we developed an eradication plan, the first in 2006, 2007. And then uh, the final version was ready in 2009. And of course, many, of, uh, many people in this, in this room participated in that. And then it was reviewed and, and updated in collaboration with uh, John Parks, Manny Fisher, and Sue Robinson in 2012. So we had the plan ready. And then we got the funding uh, from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and from um, um, a Mexican uh, foundation, uh, Fundación Carlos Slim and WWF. So basically, uh, it will involve, we were thinking at the beginning to use poisons, but it, the only two options, 1080 and PAP, are not allowed in Mexico. The first one is just completely uh, banned, and we tried to convince authorities and say, yeah, this is very important, we understand, but no. And uh, for PAP, which it's, it's, it seems that it's very um, effective, it will take like years to, to for the registration, um, in, in Mexico and then to be able to use it. So that was not an option. 
and it will be dealing with um, uh, using trapping, hunting, and detection dogs and, and other, other projects. Because we have the community, efficient community living there, and the Navy, but mostly the community, it will be very important to engage them in this project. And for them, it's very important to, they have a problem of mice in, in their houses, so it's very important for them to address that, to, to be able to support the, the eradication. And, well, also biosecurity is very important. We have a draft already, and, and Maria Melatowski, a colleague of mine, will be talking about that later. And that will be, that's just a starting, and this, um, the project started in this uh, last spring, so we're, we're into that right now. Uh, for the, the fishermen community, I'll call aboloneros and agosteros, the fish for abalone and lobster on the island. There's a whole family is living there, and they have the cats as pets, but the, mostly they have them because uh, to control the mice on their houses. So uh, we need to, to engage that to, and do, do something about it. Um, to engage them and to implement mouse co control in that area, and also to uh, help with waste management and all the measurements that would take the mouse density down in, in that area. And also there's some things that are interested and will be helpful, helpful also to take mouse densities down in, in this area will be to set up a nursery for them to have a better management of, of um, so it take a lot of, of uh, fresh uh, veggies to the island and you setting up a nursery that will decrease the, the, the amount of all the in incomes that you need to take there, all the, the supplies. So just to finish, uh, what's next? Uh, we are preparing for the first phase, the start of the, for the eradication. So building infrastructure, uh, increasing the biological station that we have right now is very small, so we're increasing that in size to be able to accommodate more people and also to set up the remote uh, camps uh, doing studies. We did this already, uh, studying the cat's harm ranges, but we, need, we wanted to do it and uh, an updated information of this. Uh, hiring personnel, training personnel, and then all the permits that we need. It is a protected area, so there are many permits that we need to get for we'll be working in this. And of course, just all the things that we need to buy that you all know. And well, that's it. I acknowledge many of the partners. Thank you. We do have time for questions. Uh, hi there. Um, just wondering, what is the what, how do you gauge the community support for removing cats and possibly uh, desexing the domestic pet cats? Yeah, so we will start with that. They, the cats that they have on the community, of course, I found of, of them. Some are there, but just take it away. I just, if you uh, solve my problem with mice, I'll, I'll be fine, just take it. Others, yeah, they, they have it as, especially for the children. They really like their pets. So it's going to be a process. Um, first, doing a sterilization and then letting them know they're going to be able to keep them for, for years, for some years. But then they're going to have to take them out. Will that involve changing some local legislation there for local cat laws? You mean for 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 uh, leave the cats to stay? Uh, just to, for legal owning a, a registered cat and not uh, adopting further stray cats down the. Oh, down okay, the track. yeah, yeah. We're going to put like a microchip and yeah, to put some marks and they they will need to um, to commit to doing that and we need to, to check. Also, because it is a protected area and in the management plan, it says that um, invasive mammals are not allowed on the island. They, they know already that they're, yeah, they need to, to take their cats out at some point. But well, it's going to be a process of several years. We're going to start, we're going to work in zones and they're like near to the south. So we're going to start in the north and in the meanwhile, just working on that with the community. But they, they know already. Mm -hmm. One quick question. Do you get many incursions uh, behind the fenced area? We had a couple at the beginning because um, the fen we put the fence and it was like on the cliff at either side. And, but then we fixed those. Noe, actually Noe, Noe's around. He built the, that's not, <laughs> he built the fence and he added uh, like additional and things at the, at the cliffs. And from there, no, we took the, the dogs and we checked, and it was it's good. Mm -hmm. awesome. yeah. 
Thank you very much, Luciana. Gracias. Please, thank you. Thank you all our wonderful six speakers of the session.